Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And Happy New, Year. Happy New Year. Turn to your neighbor and tell them Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah, last week we were not this number. This is a great number the Lord has given us. And we welcome you to church. The, first, second, the second Sunday, our DSP was able to preach officially on fast for this year. And we thank God for that. Just before I delve in the word of God, I want to mention that we are beginning our 21 days of prayer and fasting as we've been able to do in the announcements. And that means that you need to get prepared how to go about that. A caution I want to give is that some of us could be on medication. So please take caution and follow the doctor's advice if you have to eat. But you can pray for those of us who are on medication. And some of us, maybe because you are expectant or something like that, please take caution in this 21 days of prayer and fasting. We are basically going to miss lunch and breakfast and then have a light meal in the evening as we complete the fast. Then for 21 days, God will be able to bless us. The last three days, actually not the last, the five, last five days, we are going to have spiritual clinics here. What that means is that you can come here and we will be have tents here, our elders will be here, our pastors, and trust God for something. And we want to say God, may be able to move in your affairs from 9 to 4 p.m. That is from 25th all the way to 27. And then in the evening, we'll be having breakthrough worship. And breakthrough worship will basically just be a time of revival, and we pray that the Lord will bless us. Amen? How many of us are excited about prayer and fasting? Amen. That is the only way to refill our tank. For many of you who are drivers, you can only refill your tank of spirituality by prayer and fasting, by getting a time of seclusion. Now, after feasting, we will be fasting. May the Lord be able to be, able to be manifested in your life. Our theme this year is what? In his presence. Say, in his presence. In his presence. It is drawn from the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5, which says, Abide in me and I in you, and you bear much fruit. It means you are bearing fruit, but when you are in Christ, you bear much fruit. That is what I was preaching on 31st. You can check the sermon on YouTube that you can do exploit. There is much fruit that God wants you to bear if you abide in him. In fact, it says if. The word if is conditional. You can decide not to abide in Christ. And the consequence to that is that you will not bear fruits. Or you will not bear much fruit. Not that you will not bear fruit. You will not bear much fruit. That is what it means. Because if means you are able to do a conditional. So this morning or this afternoon, I want to share about the footsteps in his presence. The footsteps in his presence. How do we enter the presence of God? And before I delve in the word of God, I should be able to say that his presence means the glory of God, his glory. It denotes his manifestation. It denotes his dominion. Reverend actually dwelled on that last week when he said that, you know, when God was creating, he wanted to dominate. He wanted that his presence be felt, his manifestation in us. So when we're talking about his presence, what we're meaning is God's dominion, God's manifestation, God's way of dealing with us and showing that he's within us and he's around us. That is what we want to look at. And we will be looking at the main text from the book of John, chapter 13, verse 1 to 35. I will attempt to read the few passages, and then we will be able also to read John, chapter 14, verse 9 to 12. Let's begin with John, chapter 13, all the way from verse 1 to, um, to verse around 17, or I'll read wherever I will be able to get and then we'll be able to proceed. The Bible says it was before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the time has come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The word there is he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and he had come from God and he was returning to God. That is very paramount. He had come from God and he was returning to God. So verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who he said to him, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now that I am what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, for verse 8, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, I wash you, you will have no part with me. Then Lord Peter replied, just, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Verse 10, Jesus answered, a person, has, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His holy body is clean. And you are clean, though not everyone of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, everyone was not was and that is why he said not everyone was clean verse 12 when he had finished washing their feet he put on his cloth and returned to his place do you understand what i have done to you look at that and then he says asked then he asked him you call me teacher and lord and rightly so for that is what i am now that i your God and teacher has washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. Verse 15, where I'm taking the full step, say, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Praise the Lord. Jesus demonstrates something that I want to look at this particular afternoon in terms of his presence. While I was preaching last time, for many of you who were not there, let me take you there. In this passage, we are looking at the absence of Jesus that denotes his everlasting presence. Now, let me explain. Jesus had been with the disciples for three and about half years. And now he was almost leaving his body, his body. Now, them being with him, there is so many things with him, and they are trying to doubt now we are going to be orphans. But now in these passages, he goes to what we are saying, the farewell uh, talk with the disciples. He says, and I will be with you. In fact, you're going to do much more things that I did with you and when I was with you. And so he gives that assurance that there is an absence that is going to happen in the body of man. But spiritually, I'm going to be with you forever. Now, you understand why we're talking about his presence. His presence could be like a paradox because again, there is a person that is living. Like many of us, when you visit a hostel, and one of your dear ones starts saying those words, and they say, now you know where my money is. You know, I bought land somewhere. You get worried that he's going. But he's telling you, just be there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, in this episode, Jesus is demonstrating that. That there is an absence that is going to happen, which is now making them grapple. It's making them grapple and wonder what is this is happening. But he's saying that I'm going to be with you. Praise the Lord. So this is the episode that is happening in this place. It's going to be our reflection this particular afternoon. And I said I'm going to borrow so much from um, what we call the sermon of the, what we call the farewell speech. And some of the, um, what we call some notes that were even our presiding bishop was sharing with us in terms of outline. And then I will be able to finish. So. He, the footsteps in his presence. You are making some footsteps in his presence. We look at some four lessons and then we'll be done. But let me begin by saying that in this episode, Jesus had withdrawn with the disciples. He's in a place, what we call the upper room. It is the last supper that he's having with uh, the disciples. And he's having a very serious talk with them. And then when you read in Luke, where some of us read when we are offering the Lord's table, in, from chapter 24 to 26, the Bible says, even on that lost table, because they know he was going, the firstborn were thinking that now I will be the greatest. In fact, John was more close to Jesus than Peter. 
For people who allude in the theology that John should have been the person who would have been the first bishop in Acts. But again, Jesus in all the one way gets there. So they discuss and ask who is the greatest. In Luke chapter 22, they discuss and say, who was the greatest? You go and read and do the exegesis or the, the interpretation of Luke chapter 22. The continents of Jesus changed and he said, that does not matter who is the greatest. What Jesus wanted to affirm here is that I am with you and it doesn't matter. In fact, for many of us who do leadership, they say, now the Jesus model in Luke chapter 22 was the disciples sit on a round table. There was never to be a senior pastor. They were all to sit in a round table where all leaders were equal. So he gets very mad at them and he gets them back to the lessons that I wanted to reflect this particular morning. And one of them, he goes to them and shows them on the things that they need to know and the things which they are supposed to do. And one of them was the footsteps of love. The footsteps of love. The footsteps of love. Around that table as the commotion happens and he thinks I want to tell you that I'm going, but me when I would be passing on and I have my three sons and daughters, I would tell them, please love one another. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's just the same thing that all of you would do. One of my friends had done a very good cause in Karen and he was telling me, now that my daughters are married to different people, different personality, I'm almost writing a will, but they will fight in that house. So they would hear this thing. Jesus teach them that to be together, love one another. Praise the Lord. I am going away, but love one another. Praise the Lord. This is all thing that all of us would do when you go away and you're going on a safari, you tell your people, love one another. So Jesus does what I say, the footsteps of love. He says that what you have seen me do, do to one another. He rose from the table and he served the disciples, because he loved them. What does he show in terms of this? He talks of the sense of ownership. In, in John chapter 13, verse 1, and uh, he says, and Jesus was able to sh he show them the full extent of his love. And before that, he says, um, having loved his own. These were mine. These were mine. We have some several poultry at home. Of course, you know, for reasons best known to you. The other day they hatched, and we mixed them with the chicks. But naturally, the chicks ran to the mother. When they are mixed, all of them are small. They are, actually, all of them had seven, seven. All of them go to the mother. And the other mother was not their own. They were also, they were pricking, pricking on all. That what does. Jesus says, and he loves his own. We are Jesus. Amen. Buana Sithiwe. He says, and having loved his own, he loved us. We are his own. So there is a sense of ownership. This is ours. This is ours. Praise the Lord. And so having love, a sense of ownership comes when you love them. One of my pastors, you know my kids are small, they keep on running here. Some of you wonder how comes who's in your pastor Toto Nasumbua. So one of the ushers took the baby of one of my pastors and he says, you sit down. My pastor went and said, he's mine. This is what I'm talking about. Grappling and defending your own. And this is what Jesus does here. A sense of ownership. A sense of ownership. Watching the Nagio live the other day, and I saw, you know, the lion chases the buffaloes. And by mistake, he takes the small buffalo. Ah, uh, the mothers came back. They came back. They were running away. And there were things that happened to the mother. <laughs> this is it. Sense of ownership. Now, he does not only actually talk about that. In fact, Ezekiel says in Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 31, this is a prophetic word of Ezekiel. We could turn there. He also speaks in the word, you know, a prophet would see things before they happen. And prophet Ezekiel talks about God knowing his sheep. And he says in verse 31 of Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 31, says, You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are my people, and I am your God, declares the sovereign God. In fact, when some of you deny God, like I was saying the other day, for many of you who watched the debate, I could not watch it further. 
Even those who deny there is no God, God in heaven says, I love you. And that's why we continue to say every day and preach to you that one day you change. This is the sign of ownership Jesus is demonstrating in this place. In fact, he feeds, and at one point he gets to Judas Iscariot, and he says, one of you will betray me. And he says, who is that? He wakes up and he also sacrifices and gives him bread. What does that Jesus, what does Jesus demonstrate? He says, I love all of you, including those who don't love me. And then it, in that footstep of love, Jesus shows sacrificial love. He loved them to the outermost. The Bible said, and he loved them to the outermost. And he, he was able to, the Bible, John chapter 10, verse 11, and he laid his life down for them. Out of that sacrifice, he sacrifices his time. He sacrifices his title. And he sacrifices his resources. He takes his time in the evening in the upper room. I'm telling you, and I said in the first service, the Holy Communion or the Last Supper was a whole supper. A whole supper being offered by the Father. The Bible says, and he took the towel. He wrapped it. He was not sanitized. He did his time, and he served his disciples. That was sacrifice. He was the leader. For any matter, he was the CEO of the disciples. And he says, I'm going to serve you today. He washed their... For many of you, just look at the Holy Communion. The Holy Communion service. You know, you can't go to the Holy Communion. You can't go to the Holy Communion. You can't go to the Holy Communion. I love to be take them. That is how it was. In fact, one of our antidotes of doing, of, of, of doing the Holy Communion, you should not be in a hurry. Jesus did it slowly. He took his time of sacrifice, of time. He washed the feet. They were clean. And then he sits and he begins a conversation. It was sacrifice. When you love, you sacrifice. You sacrifice your time. And then he sacrifices his title. I was saying in the past times, that is why the leaders serve you the Holy Communion. So if you are the greater, you must serve. When you realize some of you have been giving me excuses that you are too busy to serve, one of my mentors told me, those who are busy, they are the best one to be used of God. Because God doesn't want to use people whose plates are empty. They must sacrifice part of their meal. Where is the Lord? And this is what he does. So for many of you who are busy at work, now this is it. In the footstep of his presence, you must be found serving. You must sacrifice. Look at what minutes and hour can I give to the Lord? In fact, my mentor was telling me that they can give you one hour, quality hour, because they are rushing someone. Praise the Lord. This is what Jesus does. Actually, when he gets to Judas, let me tell you, in verse, there is verse, read with me, verse 20, um, get back to John. I want to read something there. Do you know that Jesus was also in a hurry to accomplish the mission that was ahead of him? I want to read from verse, um, verse 26. Jesus answered, it is, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. When I have dipped it in the dish, then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, Simon, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Then in quotes, what you are about to do, do it quickly, Jesus told him. What is Jesus saying here is, he wants to get the mission accomplished quickly. He was desirous. The quest for him to accomplish the presence of God was quick. So he's telling you, Judas facilitate my betrayal. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is the love. So when Jesus is sacrificing this place, taking more steps, there is one who's hindering the accomplishment. Judas on his assignment. He says, do it quickly. So he means, Samasael kwa meenda. Hallelujah. So Judas is being instructed to do it quickly. You need to know, Jesus actually shows sacrifice on the disciples. So what aspects, what aspects is God calling us to in his presence, to emulate from his love? What are some aspects? We are busy, we are thinking he's away from us, he's there in the spiritual, he's not seeing us. What aspects? I want you to think about that. But I believe God is talking about concern for one another. When he served the disciples and he said that love one another, one of the things that I've not read in that passage Jesus tells the disciples, love one another. 
Now, he does not just only say that. He repeats it in passages in 14, in 15. You read it, you see that he says, love one another. One as we son. It means that love is not an easy thing. For us to be able to walk in the presence of God, I must remind you that God is reminding us to love one another. Praise the Lord. Concern for one another. Do we have a concern for one another? He's talking about that. Now, he's moving himself from the scene of absent. He thinks this guy is, maybe will not love one another. He said, love one another. Concern for one another. Another thing that I see there, which I believe we also need to do, is laying down our lives for others. He sacrifices. He sacrifices until Peter says, you cannot wash my feet. They say, no, you took a bow. This is just a spiritual cleansing. But I want to show you that sacrifice is a great thing. So we need to lay down our lives for others. Amen? Sacrificial worship. If we want to walk in the presence of God, God is inviting us to walk in the footsteps of love. He did it to himself, himself and he did it to the people that were closer to him. The second thing that I see here is the footsteps of conviction. He's moving towards conviction. The Bible says that in chapter 3, in the verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Now, Jesus knew, Jesus knew, Jesus knew that he had all the resources under his power. And he was not priding himself. In fact, it is actually, for many of you who do literature, a change of tone that I have all things under my feet, but again I'm going to serve people. The old people didn't wear shoes, by the way. To wash their feet, Jesus worked. Many of you who have read history and archaeology, the olden people used to walk like some of us did when you were standard one. Majority of you, I can tell you. Some of us wore our shoe in class seven. When we were circumcised, it was a gift. I don't know when you wore a shoe. My children wore when they were not walking. But now in these particular disciples, these are people who are walking every day. That's why he says, Yo In fact, when some of us were going to school all day, we'd only wash our feet up to here. <laughs> Girls would wash up to here because they had scats, you know? And so washing the feet of disciples, and yet he had all things under his power. This man was convicted who he was. And so he was not getting trouble by anything. Praise the Lord. You know when you, you know, I go some places nowadays we have VIP. Now people have realized the VIP are many. Now we have the VVIP. Jesus was the VVVIP, the three times of VVIP now. But he comes and does what we see in the other passages. He knew his resources. The resource for his doing this was the Father. Amen. When you know the Father, you come to the house of God and you say, Pastor, can I teach Sunday school? Praise the Lord. I'm taking the lesson home. Can I teach Sunday school? I want to see professors teaching Sunday school. Amen. They say, me, I teach adults. I want the pulpit. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to see many of us who are old going to Sunday school. Met one of Muse when we were preaching. When, when we were away, we went for two prison preaching. So I met one Muse, and he was preaching in Nigeria with me. And he said, I have so many grandchildren. So I came home, and then I like eating with them. And they finished my vegetables because, you know, in Africa, the ugali must end before vegetable. So when a vegetable ends, you know, it's a disaster. But when you know your resources, you will not actually quarrel your grandchildren for finishing the resources, which is the, the vegetable. Praise the Lord. You will do all they need to do when it troubles you and you know that God has put in me the grandfather, the gray-haired wisdom to disseminate to other people. This is what Jesus does. Amen? He knew his background. In that particular passage, he says, and knowing where he has come from, he was able to do what? Have you read with me? That is part 3B. He says, and he had 
And he knew the father had put under uh, his power and that he had come from God and was returning to the father. That passage alone has two things. One is background. Where is your background? Where is your background? Just like the story I've told you. We quarrel much because we do not know who we are. Okay? We quarrel much because who we don't know. One of the renowned speakers, I'm trying to remind his name, night myself, I was reading his story, he was traveling by train, I don't know whether he was who, and then he lost his ticket. And you know, if you don't have a ticket uh, on the air, or maybe on the, on, on the traveling by bus, you will always be denied. The other day you saw when we, our ticket says we alight at Kisumu, we touched in the Wilson, this airport, and they say, this is home. We didn't know that that Ndege would light. They say, no, you go up to the end where your ticket shows that you should alight. And you know, we had some fracas, and they say, let's be men of God. We got back to our seats, and we went to Kisumu and drove back to Eldoret. <laughs> now, the story I'm telling you is this man lost his ticket. And when he was looking his tickets, and the guy comes and he said, you, we know you. You know you, we know you. Don't look for your ticket. And he said, no, I'm not looking the ticket because you do not know me. I'm looking for the ticket because I do not know where I'm going to alight. Praise the Lord. And Jesus knew where he was coming from. When you know where you are coming from, you will do all that you need to do to have your ticket in the hand. And where are you going? His mission. You have your ticket. He knew he was going to the Father. He came from the Father. He's going to the Father. I say this, and I don't know whether I have preached here, and I said in the first service, we served in the Christian Union, and I said, one of our leaders came forth towards our time when we were almost handed to power, and he said, I want to give my life to Christ. And people say it's a joke. The leadership felt embarrassed. We selected somebody, and he's just coming to every altar call. And the lady said, let me tell you, I just come from a Christian family. I had never given my life to Christ. So I want to give my life to Christ. It's not, that I, it's not about me embarrassing you or embarrassing me. I know I have served. And she gave her life to Christ. And it was a joy to us. This is what we are talking about. Where are you? We're talking about bearing God's fruit. How does the presence of God manifest in us? When you look at our theme, he talks about his presence with fruits. Are we banana trees? I don't know whether banana is a tree. Giving back birth to bananas. Because most likely some of us are mango trees giving birth to avocados. Because we do not know where we come from. Jesus said, I have come from the Father, and I go back to the Father. So if you are not of the Father, where are you going? You are going back to yourself. And to Satan. Lango, lango, liko was. And by the way, there is a day, the Bible says, and actually salvation will be closed. Jonah saw that. And the door will be closed, and no one will actually go in the presence of God. It is open. So he says, I have come from the Father, and I'm going to the Father. Very convicted. And no circumstance of delay that actually made him doubt that he was convicted. And he washed the disciples' feet. He walked with them. Judas comes and says, do whatever you want to do quickly. It doesn't change his course. Why does discipline for men of us change us? Even your children, when you discipline them and you realize they are becoming so naughty, begin to discipline them more. I'm teaching you. The way I'm saying here is you must pursue that this thing gets to line. Otherwise, it was not on line. Praise the Lord. Jesus was convicted, and we must walk in the conviction of his presence. Amen. He knew he was from the Father. He knew his mission. So what prompts you to do or not do what you do or believe in? What is that? There are some of you who believe in your organization, and you die for it. I've seen people suck from one media house to another, and they remain to be journalists. 
But why would a pastor actually be sacked today and tomorrow is selling changa and other things? Why? Let me use an example for me and Reverend Patrick. Why? Then we are not of Christ. You need to sack me today and fire me and I become fiery for Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why would a Christian feel that they're in the church and when they are touched and hurt now, they go back to the world? Jesus was not that. He did it and he pursued it. And some of you need to pursue well. If you love your journalism, your business, and it goes down, go and begin another one. The conviction that Jesus had about his mission. Praise the Lord. That our vehicle gets down and we put it back on the wheels and we get back to the mission. The footsteps of his conviction. While Jesus was convicted about this, he realized that there were many stumbling blocks to his attaining this. And one was the, the desire of the devil. The Bible says, and Satan entered Judas. Judas was not Satan. You need to get that theology right. Jesus, Judas, was the disciple of Jesus. He was actually the treasurer. He kept the money of Jesus very well. The Bible says, and after he had taken the wine, Satan entered Judas. Did you read with me that passage? I read alone. He, it entered Judas. His footsteps of caution. Now, Jesus, as he moved there, he cautions the disciples about that. He actually cautions them about one that was going to be used by Satan. Now, that tells us that all of us, we are guilty unless charged uh, innocent. And we can also be innocent until we are charged guilty. What that means is our probability of being any side is possible. Buona sui san. So the one he loved, how would Jesus teach students? And then in the end, he cautions them. So he gives them the footstep of caution. One of our mentors, our Reverend uh, Bishop, was taking us through. Before he retired, I was in his second cohort of mentorship. So one of his class, I think he knew, he said that I will not lie to myself. We were 12 of us, 12 young pastors. He said, I will not lie to myself that all of you will do what I have said. But if I get three of you, I will be very happy. Those were his last words in our last class. After waking up in the morning, he's the one who took us to Ethiopia. We had to be mentioned to Ethiopia. We went with him. Then his last words was, I will not lie to myself that all of you will do what I have said. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The footsteps of caution. Jesus mentioned that there is an opposition from the devil, and Judas is going to be used of that. We need to be cautious of the use of the devil. Even in this prayer and fasting, know which side to go and where not to go. Many of us have great plans of investment. Avoid impulse buying. I caution you, you will come back here. Again, we will pray for you and say, prophesy again. And we will prophesy. But to be cautioned, the devil is roaring around us to oppose our plan. Jesus gives that caution. He gives actually a caution against association without commitment. Why were some people in the Jesus circle not committed? They were struggling who is the greatest. Judas was merely following Jesus. In fact, he goes out and takes the bribe that he was to receive and do what certain wanted him to do. There are people around our lives. They are not committed to what we think is going to fulfill God's purpose. Praise the Lord. Be cautious about that. In our ministries, there are people that are not cautious about what you believe. Some of you, even in your organization, not all your staff, I also have staff here, not all of them are committed. You will wake up in the morning to sit there, and you see them just coming and laughing. They can only be serious the day you see them. Jesus cautions the disciples about that. They were mere followers. There's another called Philip. I have not read that passage. I should have read it in John chapter 14. When he asked Jesus, what can I do? I should read it. It was part of my reading this day. Verse 8 of chapter 14. The Bible says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that that will be enough for us. It was not enough for them to be with Jesus, according to Philip. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, even do even greater things than this because I am going to the Father. Away from Judas, maybe who was the worst of the worst, there is Philip, who's just doubting. And I've not mentioned Thomas. You know Thomas? These were all disciples of Jesus. These were all followers of Jesus. Following Jesus without commitment. In the three years, if they were given a cut, they would have failed. In fact, at one point, you know, when Jesus asked me, who do people say I am? Some say you are a teacher. Some say they say, only Peter gets the revelation. Following without commitment. Commitment. Very dangerous thing. Jesus cautions about that. Association without commitment. They were not committed of Christ. They could not pray. They could not see why Jesus was teaching them. Jesus says that I called my 12 disciples, that they may be with me, and I with them. Now, they were with Jesus, but they did not allow Jesus to be with them. Let me break it down. There are many of us who associate ourselves with Jesus because we see miracles. But we have not allowed him to indwell in us. That's why we are saying, and he abide in me. The essence is, be associated and be committed. Let's be cautioned. First step of caution, self-destructive tendencies. Gain on Judas on that particular place. The devil was just sitting to use anyone. <laughs> Lest be you. One as we son. Self-destruction. Wewe unataka kuwa sahani ya kubeba. Shetan. This is it. He cautions them. That's why you need to pray. I dare tell you every morning, if you do not know how to pray long prayer, pray the Lord's prayer. And repeat the place and say, Lord, do not lead me into temptation. Amen. This is it. To whom? Because I want to believe that now Judas became a chosen one for eternal condemnation. There is no, he chose himself. The Bible says, and Satan was there to enter anyone who was willing. Self, it is self-inflicted. No one should blame that Jesus chose Judas. Because Satan was just around there. In fact, the Bible, theologians say, Peter almost also went. The third shekels or something. Self-destruction. It is not, no one is going to bewitch you. You will bewitch yourself. It is here. He cautions you about that. No one is, in fact, somebody has said, I was listening to one of the greatest speakers. They say, you cannot pray for prosperity. You cannot pray for success. Now, we pray for that. But what you are saying is, work towards success. Beware. Beware. The thing is, beware. Footsteps of caution. Be cautioned about, upon taking no stand because of fear. You know, chapter 13, 24, I want us to read there. Peter said this. Uh, Simeon Peter mentioned to his disciple and asked, ask him which one he means. You know, so he's just worried. Some of us be cautioned. Be cautioned. Be cautioned, because you are denying no one of us can deny. Some of us can say even this, someone is not relevant to us. Jesus had the spiritual eye to see what was happening. But after he takes them to the footsteps of conviction, the footsteps of, um, of love, and he talks to them about the footsteps of uh, uh, love, of conviction, and of caution, Jesus now brings in what I say, his footprints. He walked, he walked and stood, and he put the indelible mark and said, this I want you to say. Why you should follow me in the footsteps of this. He gives his signal, his badge, his brand, and his brand is that I am the symbol of God living among you. The symbol of incarnation, his footprint to follow. Why should we walk in this footstep? I am God 
in the Father. He says, the Father is me and I in the Father. It is enough. Praise the Lord. None of you denies your father, including us preachers. Whether they are drunkards, whether they are lame, whether they are all those manner of things. They are our fathers. Sini ukweli. Ama kuna watu hapa na zemanga na jipake kala vizuri. This is what Jesus said. He says, follow me because I am God incarnate. The footprint to follow him. We do not follow Christ for anything else. He says, I have come from the Father to be a man, and I'm going there. So follow me because I'm there. Woe unto you if you have to remind your children that you are the Father. Woe unto you if you have to remind your juniors you are the CEO. Jesus had to do it because of unbelief. But let's follow him. He's the footprint. The sign is on the wall. He's the Father God incarnate. The one we celebrated in Christmas. Buana Suesa. It is simple like that. I'm the Father. You ask your children, look at your ID. What is your third name? It is simple. This is what Jesus is saying. Your third name reads that I am from the Father. I'm your Father. And he's our Father. So we must follow him because he's God incarnate. He took himself that frail humanity to come and live among us. We must walk in his presence. I'm saying this and I'm repeating this for some people to know because some of you doubt that God is not God because you have not got that promotion. You are not getting that business. You have not. He says, I have come from the Father. One as we said. So follow me. Your choice is yours. The second thing that he says, follow me, he says, I will wash your feet. Because the other body is okay. What he's saying is, I'm giving you spiritual cleansing. The sanitation of belonging. He said, and that is enough. That day you give your life to Christ, it is enough. I don't know whether I have said here or said in the past service. When somebody gives their life to Christ and they are led through that short prayer, they say, only that. And now I'm saved. I have been sinning for... You know, some of us have been sinning since we were born because we were born with Adamic sin. So you say a prayer of two minutes. So I told you of this young man who had some wine here, and he says, so what do I do with this wine after that prayer? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because nobody can not imagine that five-minute prayer of confessing Christ can be enough. Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and he says, and your whole body is cleansed. Now, those who have done mathematics, please help me next Sunday to understand what portion is a leg of my whole body. That is how minute Jesus demonstrates an act of faith of following him. That I glance you once by you just accepting those things that look foolish and your whole body is cleansed. Sense of cleaning. He cleans the feet. The dirty part. Then the rest is clean. The footprint that you need to understand. The seventh wound of a leader. Jesus Bible says, and he walked from the table. He took the basin. All those assignments were done by Jesus. So we didn't have the waiter and the server. You know the way you go to the hotel? Jesus did all those tasks that are normally done to you in a five-star hotel. And so he comes and he serves. I think during our Thanksgiving, Reverend Patrick, next year, we need to wash people's feet. And they come walking, don't come driving. And see where the pastor would still be seated there. <laughs> this is a footprint of service. Praise the Lord. They say a great leader will never be a leader until he's a follower. A leader can never be a leader until he's a follower. Now, if some of you are seeking promotion and you are not picking many jobs, then you are not a leader. What Jesus does is an epitome and epicenter of us to follow him. He said, we would want to be with that man, that man that come in our village. One of the things that I talk about and I want to say as your senior pastor, let's love one another irrespective of where we live. When I was in Nairobi, we heard those who were in Lower Karen and Upper Karen. Lower Karen is Kibira. 
And Lower Karen has few people visiting from Lower Karen. The, lower, the Upper Karen can be visited by anyone. May God help us. We get this upside down philosophy, as somebody has said, to serve one another. The when we come here, when I came with my vehicle, that's the bits, and you came with your range, or you came with the, this, that will be good. This is it. It is a footprint. We can follow God in his presence if we understand what he did. I'm just teaching you this thing about his presence. Some of you need to choose, and I said it in the past service, we went for a training. I'm involved in the majority of writing of CETA materials, even the material on the, the year. I'm one of the authors of one chapter and one month lessons. So when you are writing that, I was not a deputy by then. One of the senior pastors walked from his table, and he served, no, he didn't serve me. He asked me how many spoonful of sugar. I said, I'm going to serve. He said, I'm serving you. He touched me. Praise the Lord. And this is what Jesus is doing. When many of us will serve, fathers in the house, please plan this year to cook dinner. I will cook. Amen. Cook dinner. Wash the house. Not with the mopper, the other one. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is what Jesus is doing here. He rubbed his waist. It is an epitome of us to follow him in his presence. And he says, now I have gone to prepare for you a place that you may come to be with me. It's a footprint. It's written on the wall for us to read. And for us, this is not a footstep. It is written there. I want you to read. Praise the Lord. He is seeking Gereza na Cheza na I in Guinea Lukwa Kutembea in love, in conviction, in caution, in Kusimama na Kusoma. Praise the Lord. And do what Jesus did. And that God will bless us in this year. Amen. I want to bring this service to an end and say, Jesus came to be with us, just like he was with the disciples. So that we may learn, the thing was that we may learn the footsteps, that we may be learned to be with him forever, in his absence in the body and in his presence in the spirit. That is what he wanted us to be. It was a lesson to be emulated that we must know how to love and how to be inspired to have conviction to follow him. And this is vital in dwelling in his presence. However, we need to be very cautious because as much as we can be desirous to follow Christ, there are things that we need to avoid, and I've mentioned them. I pray that God will be able to prune some of them, because some of you, if you don't do, part of this scripture says, and those who do not bear much fruits, he prunes. There is that part which I'll bring to you later in this series, that if you do not allow God to caution you, he will come and prune you. He will prune you. Some of you, if you don't release yourself to God, God will make you blind, <laughs> like, like, like Saul. And then when you wake up, you say, I will follow Christ. He prunes. He says, he prunes. So be cautioned until he prunes. Some of you need to pray. I've gone to hostel the other day, and I saw many people were sick. Well, with the I had to pray for everyone there. People were wrenching in pain. And I say, God, if I am well, allow me to be visiting those who are sick. But if you want to be sick to see, because I went there to visit people. For some of you to see those sick people. So that you start praying to be well. You may be sick there. Don't pray to go there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The question that you must be able to do. May we be found worthy of the fruitfulness in dwelling in his presence. Amen. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8. It is the desire of God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So his presence is that we can walk in it. We can read it. I want to pray for us as we bow our heads down. I don't know what God has spoken to you. But if God is speaking to you and you are feeling something, maybe from that someone that you need to change, you are cautioned about, maybe it's a struggle within your family or a struggle within yourself, or it's a struggle within the environment where you work. Because again, Judas was associating himself, seems to be, with the people that wanted Jesus because they bribed him. 
He was so close, so he could be handed over the few shillings. I want to pray with you. Just come here. We want to pray that God visit you in a special way.